Let's turn in our Bibles to Romans chapter 9, one of the most difficult and I think probably most neglected passages in all of the scriptures. Romans chapter 9 speaks to the sovereignty of God, and we've been talking about that the last couple of weeks. Romans chapter 9, beginning with verse 14. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. Remember, sovereignty means he's not governed by any external force. So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. For the scripture says to the Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills he hardens. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who has resisted his will? But indeed, O oh man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, why have you made me like this? Does not the potter have power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel of honor and another of dishonor? What if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on vessels of mercy? which he had prepared beforehand for glory, even as it, even us, whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Whenever we talk about the sovereignty of God, a number of questions are always brought up. Well, what about man's free will? What, how then, is man held responsible if God is absolutely sovereign? And these are good questions. These are legitimate questions. Okay? Now, we don't want to be argumentative and denying God's authority and God's sovereignty. As it says here, shall the thing formed say to the one who formed it, why have you made me thus? But I think to an honest inquirer, somebody who's seriously trying to understand who God is, as we all are, and hence our study, these are questions we, we ought to give attention to and, and take seriously. I will tell you this, and as we've been talking about on Wednesday nights, and I've said over and over again, be careful, don't find things in the Bible that aren't there. You know, there's a lot of things that people believe and teach and sometimes even quote that are not found anywhere in the pages of Scripture, okay? And I want you to know that the term free will appears only in the Old Testament in the context of an offering, a free will offering. The Bible nowhere teaches that the human will is free. On the contrary, uh, the Bible teaches that we are depraved and we are fallen and we are bound by our sin natures. And we'll, we'll get into that in the message. Popular opinion among most Christians today is that man's will is free, that he comes to salvation by willingly cooperating with the Holy Spirit. Now, as I said last week, this is outright heresy. Salvation is the work of God and God alone. It is not a cooperative work between God and us. Any denial or diminishing of man's will and therefore his role in securing his own salvation is looked upon with great disfavor. We cannot escape the fact, however, that if God is God, then he is absolutely in control of everything, including our salvation and including our will. And the reality is that our wills are in bondage to our own fallen, dead, depraved nature. Now, there was a, a gentleman by the name of uh, Desiderius Erasmus, who was a uh, 
contemporary and a colleague and a friend of uh, Martin Luther. And in September of 1524, he published a work called, he was a, he was a Dutch Roman Catholic philosopher and theologian. He published a work called On Freedom of the Will. It didn't take long for Luther to respond. In December of 1524, just three months later, he published a work that's called On the Bondage of the Will. De servo arbitrio, which literally translates the unfree will. <laughs> so Erasmus publishes his book, The Free Will, and Luther comes back and writes, no, 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 the unfree will, the bondage of the will. And the bondage of the will has become a classic and, and a, a enduring work, writing of, of Martin Luther. In it, he spoke of the corruption and bondage of the will that is a reality that man hates to admit and insists to deny until, until God sovereignly reveals the truth of it to him. A.W. Pink, again, we've been quoting Pink a lot in these last couple of days. Uh, Pink, A.W. Pink wrote a book called The Sovereignty of God. This is what he said. He said, much of the unsound doctrine which we now hear on every hand is the direct and logical outcome of man's repudiation of God's expressed estimate of human depravity. Men are claiming that they are increased with goods and have need of nothing and deny that they are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Of course, it's a reference to Revelation chapter 3 and verse 17, the Laodicean church. They prayed about the ascent of man. Who wrote that? Darwin, right. The ascent of man. Uh, by the way, you know, Darwin wrote The Origin of the Species. The ascent of man is really where he talks about the evolution of, uh, you know, animals and ape to apes and apes to men and that sort of thing. The ascent of man. Uh, they, they prayed about the ascent of man and they deny his fall, the fall of man. They put light for darkness and darkness for light. They boast of the free will of man when, in fact, man is in bondage to sin and the slave of Satan taken captive by him at his will. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 26. A.W. Pink. The Bible never speaks of man having free will, but rather demonstrates that his moral, uh, demonstrates his moral and spiritual inability. Inability. This, of course, raises one of the most complex questions as to the relationship between man's spiritual inability and what? His responsibility. As the question goes, how can God hold a man responsible for something that he's not capable of doing? Okay, we'll get into that. What about, they say, what about Joshua Chapter 24 and verse 15. You remember Joshua said, Choose you this day whom will you serve? What about that? Doesn't that prove that it's up to man to make a choice? Well, who was Joshua speaking to? Was he speaking to the heathen? Was he saying, speaking to the heathen and saying, Choose whether you want to follow God? No, who was he speaking to? He was speaking to God's covenant people. People to whom God had revealed himself, made himself known, and with whom he had established a covenant. God's distinct people, the Jews. Those who we would say were saved. Choose this day whether you're going to serve God or whether you're going to serve the gods of this world. And that's a choice that every Christian has to make every single day. Romans 3 and verse 11 says, There is no one who understands, none who seeks God. Uh, we'll look at that passage tonight in, in some more detail when we talk about our condemnation as sinners. Uh, John 5 and verse 40, You will not come to me, he said, that you might have life. John 1 and verse 11, He came into his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe in his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man. 
but they were born of God. And Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 and 9 says, By grace you've been saved through faith, and that, that what? That faith, not of, its, of yourselves, it, that faith, is a gift of God. God gives us the faith to believe. Not the result of works that no one should boast. Now, you know, a lot of Christians say, well, believing is not a work. Well, according to God, it is. He says, this is the work of God, that you should believe in the one who sent me. So, let's get into this. And it's, again, I told you last week, for some of you, this is going to be difficult. My promise to you is I will only present what the Bible says, and I will do my best to present it honestly and truthfully in its context. And you will have to receive it and evaluate, in some cases, what you hold as a precious belief and hold it up to the light of the scriptures, okay? It's not my purpose to cause confusion or to, you know, start a theological fight here or anything, but to get you to really analyze and honestly evaluate, do I believe what the Bible teaches about God? I want to know God for who he is in all of his glory, in all of his splendor and majesty, in all of his sovereignty. Number one, what is the nature of our will, our human will? What is the will? What do we mean when we say that? What is, what is your will? Now, one of the greatest, well, probably the greatest American scholar, and that's not the opinion of religious people, that is what he was called by uh, very scholarly people. America's greatest scholar of all time, Jonathan Edwards. This is what he said. He said, that free will is the mind choosing. Edwards declared that free moral agents always act according to the strongest inclination that they have at any moment of choice. That is to say that we always choose according to our inclinations and we always choose according to our strongest inclination at any given moment. The other night, I was sitting at home, and uh, I, I was very tired. I had been out shoveling snow several times. I'm sure you did too. This has been a week, hasn't it? But I was out shoveling snow, and I had come in, and I was trying to study, but honestly, I was sitting on the couch, and I was just nodding off, and I was very tired. And I, I really just wanted to go up and go to bed, and then the phone rang. Phone rang. And it was Bethany. And she said, Dad, what are you doing? I said, well, nothing right at the moment, honey. What do you need? She said, well, I need a favor. I've cut my foot open and I need to go to the hospital. And uh, our car, we, we have a problem with our tire and Michael doesn't really want to drive the car and we'd have to drag Lucas out. And I was wondering if you could come up and get me and take me to the hospital. I said, of course I will. So I, I got, you know, I went, I actually, Went in the kitchen and had a little uh, energy drink and something to perk me up a little bit. And I went out and I cleaned off the driveway a little bit. And I drove the car and I drove up and I got Bethany. We took her to the hospital. Nothing serious. She's okay. But suddenly, my will, my intentions changed. I want you to picture this. It's a frigid morning just like this. Sub-zero weather. And it's early in the morning. It's 2.30, 3 a.m. And you're sleeping in your house in your warm bed. All your children are with you in, in their beds. And everyone is nestled, you know, snugly. What's that, what's that poem about the night before Christmas? Snug, snuggled in their beds. Visions of sugar plums dancing in their heads. Furnace is on, your house is nice, nice and warm, you've got an electric blanket on, it's 20 below outside and you're in your house. And I come frantically rapping on your window and saying, hey, get up, come outside, get up and come outside. What are you going to say to me? You're insane, I'm not going to do it. But then you start to smell smoke and I say, listen, your house is on fire. Oh, now it's a different story. 
Now I have a different inclination and a stronger inclination than to be warm and comfortable in my house. Now I want to flee for safety. Choice necessarily implies the refusal of one thing in favor of another. In every act, there will be a preference and a choice. Something has always preconditioned us to make those choices. Everyone's will is conditioned by something. For some, it's emotion. For some, it's logic. You know, you can always tell, are you, are you talking to an emotional person or a logical, rational? You know, hmm, let's think of all the options, you know. How do we think? But for all of us, our will and our preferences are conditioned by our nature. And our nature is fallen and depraved and sinful. Consider a brother who wants to come to evening service, but he's very tired on Sunday afternoon. And so he weighs the options and he has to go to work on Monday morning and support his family. And so what does he do? He stays home. Something outweighed his will, his desire to come to church. Let's talk about the nature of the will, but let's also talk about the bondage of the human will. Adam, admittedly, was created free. He had a free will. He was created in a state of holiness. Some say innocence. I would argue no. He was created in a state of holiness. He had a relationship with God. He knew God. He knew God's will. He lived in a pristine environment. More than mere innocence, he was predisposed to holiness and obedience. There was no sin in him. All of his descendants, however, are born with a sin nature. We are sinners by nature and by choice. With a deceitful and desperately wicked heart, who none of us can know the depths of, Passed down from father to child over and over again. Sinner's will is bound to and the servant of his own depraved, fallen nature, his own wicked heart. John 8 and 34, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. Romans 6 and verse 20, he said, When you were slaves to sin, you were free from righteousness. Paul actually wrote that. Notice that the, the sinner is free in the sense that nothing from without, nothing from outside compels him to sin. God does not compel anyone to sin. Okay? But he is a sinner. He has inherited that sin nature from his father. And he's free to sin all he wants to. And he's bound by his nature from doing good and seeking after God. Now you say, well, how free is free? I've illustrated it this way sometimes. If you have a, a dog, let's say you have a, a black Labrador, and you have a, a 60 by 60 foot yard, and you put the dog out in the yard and there's a fence around him, most of us would say he's pretty free. As opposed to if we put him in a six by six foot cage, he wouldn't be free. But the truth of the matter is he's got more room to roam around in the yard, but there's still a fence and he's still not completely free. Furthermore, he can only do things that a dog will do. He can't stand up and talk. He can't reason. He can't, uh, you know, do calculus. He's a dog and a dog by nature is a dog. And even if he's in a 600 by 600 foot yard, he's still fenced in. Our will is always bound by our nature, just as Jesus's will was completely holy. Therefore, he did not and he could not sin. See, now I'm not saying he didn't have the power to. I'm saying that it was against his nature to. Okay. Suppose I took my Bible here and, you know, I, I held it up over my head and I let it go, what would happen? I'm not gonna do it, I take care of my Bible. But if I did, it would, it would fall to the ground, right? It would fall to the ground, downward. Every time, every time. If I raise it up here, let me find it. 
Here's a, here's a mouse pad, right? It's always going to fall to the ground. You, you knew that would happen when I let go of it, right? Of course you did. Why did I have to prove it? I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> God doesn't push us down into sin. It's our nature. We fall into sin. We are fallen. If I want to raise up my Bible, I must lift it up by some external power acting upon it. Can a sinner turn toward heaven, toward God, of his own free will? No, he can't. His nature is always to turn away from God. God must draw him to himself. We are slaves to sin. We are free from righteousness. Free to fall in one direction only, down. Our will is bound and our nature is fallen. Number three, let's talk about the inability of the human will. Does it lie within man's ability to obey God and turn to him? The answer defines your concept of human depravity and human nature. Now this is where the term, and I know some of you don't like this term, total depravity comes from. Total depravity doesn't mean as, uh, what's his name, the worm, uh, Dennis Rodman wrote a book years ago called As Bad As I Want to Be. I don't recommend it to you. You take one look at Dennis Rodman and you can pretty well know that, no, it's not a book you want to read. But total depravity doesn't mean we're as bad as we could possibly be. It just simply means that there's nothing in us that is worth saving. There's nothing in us to commend us to God. And there's nothing in us that would cause us to seek after God. We're not partially depraved. We're not really, really sinful, but we still have the ability to seek after. No, we're totally depraved. That's where the term comes from. Does the Bible teach the basic goodness of man or the utter sinfulness of man? Man's depravity is total. Sin has affected every part of his faculty, every faculty of our nature, our spirit, our soul, our body. We are slaves to sin. Ephesians 2 and 1 says, You has he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Dead in trespasses and sins. Hold that thought. In which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Man's total depravity, also consider man's fallen nature. Man is unable to do the things that he would do, paralyzed by his own moral inability. We are slaves to sin and to the devil. John 8 and verse 44 says, You are of your father the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. See, sin is more than just an act or even a series of acts. It is a condition. It is, as Romans calls it, a law. It has permeated and penetrated every aspect of our being. The mind, the heart, the understanding is all blinded. The will has not escaped. The will is not free. It is under dominion of sin and of Satan and of our own wicked, depraved hearts. Romans 3.11, there's none that understands, there's none that seeks after God. If man is ever to turn to God, it's because God moves upon him. Why? Because the will is bound and regulated and controlled by our fallen, dead nature. If you want to see an illustration of this, look no further than the book of Luke, or I'm sorry, the book of John. The account of the resurrection of Lazarus. Lazarus was a good man, right? Lazarus was a, a, a very good man. A good brother, a good worker. Only thing wrong with him was he was, yeah, he was dead. He was dead. Jesus made that clear, didn't he? He said, our friend Lazarus sleeps and I'm going to go wake him. And they said, Lord, let him sleep. He'll get better. And he said, no, no, no. Dude, dudes, he's dead, dead, muerte. You know? 
Jesus went and called him by name, and he raised him, and he came out of the tomb alive. But before Jesus gave him life, he could have never responded. By the way, he could have never refused either. He was dead. No argument. He was dead until Jesus commanded him to come forth and also empowered him and regenerated him, gave him life. John 6, 44 says, No man can come to me except the Father who sent me draws him. Psalm 110 and verse 3, Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. Now compare this discussion to God's holy nature. We're talking about our depraved nature. Let's talk about God's holy nature. We talked about God's holiness a couple weeks ago. We're told that God is sovereign and almighty. Is he free? Is he absolutely free? Of course he is. That's the meaning of sovereign. But he's holy. Therefore, he cannot lie. He cannot be tempted to sin. Why not? I thought he could do anything. He can do anything in accordance with his nature. And you and I can do a lot of things in accordance with our nature. But it is not of our nature to do good to do what is right and pleasing before God. Doesn't mean we can't do some good things, but we can't do anything that would merit salvation. Why can't he? Sovereign means he's not controlled by any outside influence. What limits him is his own holiness, his own nature. Likewise, our will is bound by our nature, and we are not holy. In fact, holy means not like us, right? We are sinful, we are fallen, so all we can do is sin. John 8, 36, if the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Jesus, think about this, was the only one who ever walked on this earth since Adam who was totally and absolutely free. That is to say, he wasn't bound by a sin nature. And he said it was his meat, his desire, his duty to do the will of his Father in John 4, verse 34. Isn't that amazing? Even though he was absolutely free, he said he was bound to do the will of his Father. So what is it we're freed from? We talk about being freed from sin, freed from death, freed from hell. First and foremost, we are freed from ourselves, from our own sin nature. We are set free not to sin. God doesn't violate anyone's nature by withholding them from sin, nor by allowing lost men to sin according to their own will, and their own nature. You with me so far? Well, let's deal with some of these questions that come up. Here's the first one. Does God force, or we might say impose, his will upon us? Let me ask you this. Did he force Lazarus to come out of the tomb? You tell me. Some might say, I, I, he did. I, I, don't, I don't see that in the text. Jesus called him and he came. I think he made a choice to come. Right? But remember, he had to be resurrected first. Remember our, or I should say, Jonathan Edwards' definition of free will? Our inclination at any given time? God changed his inclination. God changes our inclinations. This is talking about, and we'll get into this at some point perhaps, the sovereign will of God. Okay, when we talk about the will of God, we talk about God's sovereign will as opposed to his permissive will. What's the difference? God's sovereign will, he accomplishes absolutely, perfectly by his own decree. His permissive will is when he tells you, you know, remember my day, keep my day holy. Don't neglect the tithe. You know, don't look at a woman, men with lust or vice versa. Don't uh, be angry in your heart. That's a sin. Don't lust. Don't steal. Don't covet. And we do it anyway. God permits us. He doesn't uh, compel us not to. 
So there's a sovereign aspect of God's will and there's a permissive aspect. Is God able to keep us from sinning? Yes. Would he do such a thing? Perhaps. If so, why not always? Why not always? I'll give you a couple of examples. In, in Genesis chapter 20 and verse 6, God is speaking to Abimelech, the king of Gerar, in, the, in a dream. And, and this is with regard to Sarah. Remember when uh, uh, Isaac took uh, Sarah, or Abraham, I'm sorry, Abraham. He took uh, Sarah and he said, this is my sister. This is my sister. And uh, God spoke to Abimelech in a dream and he said, yes, I know that in the integrity of your heart, you've done this. And I've also kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Why did God keep him from touching her? Numbers 22 and verse 38. Balaam said to Balak, look, I have come to you. Now have I any power at all to say anything? The word of God puts, the, the word that God puts in my mouth, that I must speak. God won't let me say anything except what he's put in my mouth. Boy, don't you wish that were true all the time? That God would keep you from saying things that he hasn't put in your mouth. How many of you have ever got in trouble because of your mom? 2 Chronicles 17, 10. Now the dread of the Lord was on all the kingdoms of the land which were around Judah, so that they did not make war against Jehoshaphat. Why didn't God put that same dread in those guys in the airplanes on 9-11? Why didn't God put that same dread in Adolf Hitler and all of the Nazis during the Holocaust? Why did God prevent these from sinning, but not Adam and Eve in the first place? For me, every time I turn around, it seems. Why not withhold Satan from falling in the first place? The world would be a better place, right? I don't know. God had a purpose. And it better served his perfect purpose to allow these things. That we might know him and know his grace and his mercy and his love. The Bible says where, great, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. You know, I think about it. How would you know God's grace if it hadn't been for your sin? Now, Shall we go on sinning that grace may abound? No, Paul says, no, that's, God forbid, that's not the point. But you wouldn't know God's grace or God's mercy. You wouldn't know God's love. You surely wouldn't know God's eternal love and his eternal security if it weren't for the fact that we've all sinned against him, even as believers. We wouldn't understand anything of his grace or his mercy. Second question, how are sinners to be held responsible to do what they utterly are unable to do? Or how can they be condemned, put another way, how can they be condemned for not doing what they cannot do? Let me ask you this, what is man responsible for? What's the chief end of man? We said it was to, to glorify and to love and obey and to serve God. But he's unable to, he's a sinner. So he's responsible to repent. He can't do that either. In his own strength, he can't come to Christ. John 6, 44 says, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draws him. John 5 and verse 40, You're not willing to come to me that you might have life. What do we mean by coming to Christ? Why is man unable? Because of our sinful nature, right? But we're responsible because we freely choose to do that which we are able to do or not do what we are able to do. You see, we indulge our own sinful desires. God doesn't force anybody to sin. We choose to. We sin because we like to. Let's just, let's just be honest. Someone comes to church, not on a Sunday, but, you know, during the week. We've had people come in and, you know, are you the preacher? Yes. Uh, well, here's the thing. I uh, wonder if you could help me out with some money. This happens. And I'm not talking about, members. listen, if you have a need, you're a member of this church family, we, we will delight to help you. You know, I don't, don't. You know, be honest here. Let, let's let's be reasonable. But it, it is our privilege and our joy to 
take care of one another. Amen? We're all in agreement about that? Somebody has a need. I mean, you have a serious need, and you're doing without something that you desperately need, and you haven't told us, well, shame on you. You're robbing us the privilege of being a church family. Amen? But I'm talking about somebody comes in off the street, doesn't go to church, doesn't have any interest in the things of God, says he needs money to buy food for his children, and yet he smells of cigarettes. He reeks of cigarette smoke. So we set up a time, we go over to visit his house, and we walk in and he's sitting on his couch watching a big screen cable TV. You see, he has the ability to do what he wants to do. We all make choices, don't we? Chooses to feed his habit, but not his children. Chooses to watch cable, and, but not come to church. Chooses to obey his flesh, but not God. Everyone makes choices. Question number three, how are men, let us see, how are men responsible for things that were decreed by God? Oh, that's a tough question. How can we be held responsible for things, for, even for sins that were decreed by God? Look at, in the text, it talks about the Pharaoh. He says to Moses, I'll have mercy on whomever I'll have mercy, I'll have compassion on whomever I'll have, have compassion. We're talking about Pharaoh here. Scripture says, for this very purpose to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I've raised you up that I might show my power in you and that my name may be declared in all the earth. And so the Bible teaches us in uh, Exodus chapter 10 and verse one, as, as the plagues were coming, Pharaoh hardened his heart, Pharaoh hardened his heart. And then God finally said, you know what? I'm gonna harden Pharaoh's heart even some more. And then I'm gonna harden his heart again. He's getting to where he thinks he can't bear this. No, no, I'm gonna harden his heart again. God hardened his heart. Now, you, you know, we could get into a discussion. There, there were 10 uh, deities that God was bringing a curse upon, and God had only cursed six or seven of them to that point, and there were some more, and so God hardened his heart so he could get them all. But, you know, there's all sorts of things we can talk about. But the other, the other one that comes up all the time is Judas. Judas. Did Judas have a choice? Well, the Bible says... Back in Zechariah 11 and verse 12, they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. You know, this, this didn't come as a surprise to God. This was all purposed by God, right? In fact, in John 6 and 70, Jesus answered that I have not chosen you 12, and one of you is a devil. He goes on and said that he spoke this about Judas, whom he had chosen that would betray him. Judas had no conscious desire to fulfill God's decree. That is to be the betrayer. But he did it to fulfill his own evil heart, his own evil intention. All 12 of these men followed Jesus. But the Bible tells us that he was a thief and he kept the bag. And so he was justly guilty because he declared, I have betrayed innocent blood. But did he repent? Not that we're aware of. In fact, he went out and he hanged himself. And even the crucifixion, even in and of itself, that's number three. Acts chapter two and verse 23, the Bible says, this man delivered up by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. So what is it that makes men guilty when they do things that were decreed? I'll tell you what, it's again, the depravity of the heart and their wicked motive. You see, they didn't crucify Jesus so as to gladly and gloriously fulfill God's redemptive plan, did they? No, the Bible tells us that they hated him without a cause. And to argue that man is not morally responsible is to deny that they had any hatred for Jesus or animosity toward him. They were just trying to accomplish God's perfect plan, right? They were uniting, the, they were like Henry Black, he says, find out what God's doing and join him in, right? No, that's not what they were doing. We all know better than that. They crucified Jesus Ready? They crucified Jesus of their own 
free will. They weren't compelled to. They chose to. Let me wrap up. We're out of time. Letter D, how can sinners be held responsible if they've been predestined or elected by God? Here we are again. Sinners are responsible to repent and believe. We don't know. Nobody knows if they're... Listen, lost people don't know if they're elect. Lost people don't care if they're elect, right? We're responsible to obey God's revealed will, his commandments. Acts 17, 30, but now God commands all men everywhere to repent. Are they going to? No, but they're commanded to. 1 John 3 and verse 23, this is the commandment that we should believe in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. We are commanded to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Sinners are responsible to repent and believe. Number two, sinners are responsible for their own choices. Has God ever commanded us to do something that's impossible? Of course he has. Didn't he tell Lazarus to, to come out of the tomb when he was dead? Didn't he tell a blind man to see? Didn't he tell a lame man to get up and walk? Therefore, be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect, Matthew 5, 48. 1 Corinthians 15, 34. Awake to righteousness and don't sin. Sin not. Don't sin anymore. Does God command us not to sin anymore? You bet he does. How many of you are going to keep that commandment? 1 Peter 1, 16. Be ye holy as I am holy. You are commanded by God to be as holy as he is. So the fact that God commands it doesn't mean that we must have the ability to do it. That's the argument. Some have. If God commands it, we must have the ability. Now, in fact, we don't have time to get into it, but that was the nature of the whole start of this debate when St. Augustine, remember Augustine, he wrote a prayer and it was basically, Lord, command what you will. And I forget his wording, but something to the effect of empower us to do what you command. And Pelagius came along and said, that's ridiculous. God wouldn't command us to do something unless we had the power to do it. That would be unfair. And we've had this same debate now going for 2,000 years. So. Listen, you want to have a takeaway from this sermon? It remains true. It remains true. Romans 10 and verse 13. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Do we have the ability to do that? No, not in, our, in and of ourselves, but whoever does, whoever calls on the Lord will be saved. James 4, 17, to him that knows to do good and does not do it, to him it's sin. Luke chapter 12 and verse 48, the Bible says, for everyone to whom much is given from him, much will be required. You see, you're sitting here and you've heard the gospel. You've heard, I, 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 I am certain that if you've been sitting here for the last eight years in this congregation, or however long you've been coming here, you have heard the gospel prevent, presented, prevented, presented very clearly and plainly. If you haven't heard it from me, you have a Bible on your lap. You should have read it. You will be responsible for what you know and what you've heard. Let me close with this verse. This is a verse that I found that makes a lot of sense out of this discussion. Because I, I, I'll be the first to acknowledge this is a very complicated discussion. Okay. Deuteronomy 29, 29. Deuteronomy 29, 29. You can look up the context. I promise you I'm not taking it out of any kind of context or anything. It says this. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. The secret things. What are the secret things? You know, God's eternal sovereign, preordained plan, council of eternity, whom he's chosen and whom he has not, and whom he's elected, and all those wonderful theological questions. The secret things belong to God. But those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. 
You see, God gave the law and then he repeated it again to the new generation in Deuteronomy. And at the end of the book of Deuteronomy, God says to the people, don't you worry about all these kinds of deep theological questions. You just do what I told you to do. That's your part. The things that are revealed are revealed for you to obey. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's revealed. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You mean if I call out to Jesus and cry out to him and ask him to save me, he'll save me? Yes, that's revealed. The Bible commands all men everywhere to repent. You mean I'm responsible for repenting because I've been told that I must repent? Yes. Well, what about the lost? You know, if God's going to save them, they're going to get saved, right? Why do we have to go? Because the Bible says, go ye into all the world. Don't worry about who's elect. The Bible says, go into all the world and make disciples. That's the revealed part. That's what you're responsible to do. Let me ask you just a series of questions as we close. Do you know that you are a guilty sinner of your own choosing? Do you understand that Jesus died on the cross for you to pay the penalty for your sin? Do you sense that he's calling you to put your trust in him for salvation? Well, if you do, then will you come to him even today and be saved? And then will you proclaim him to others who don't know him so that they might also be believe and be saved? The secret things belong to God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and our children so that we might do all the word of this law. Let's bow our heads and pray together. O oh, sovereign Lord, these are questions that are way beyond our ability to comprehend and understand. We can't possibly comprehend the counsel of your eternal plan. And yet, Lord, you've made it so simple. You've told us that we are to believe and to trust in you. The just, you said, shall live by faith. And so, Lord, I pray that today there are those here that you are prompting even now whose hearts you are touching and pricking that they would even in this moment turn to you in simple childlike faith say lord i don't understand a lot of these things but i do know that jesus loves me jesus loves me this i know for the bible tells me so Lord, I desire to put my faith and trust in you, and I trust you to save me. For Jesus' sake, in his name I pray. Amen.